today I will be helping you pick your poison or how to choose a stable coin. Because the thing is, there really is no ideal stable coin. They all have their flaws and we'll be looking at a few objective and subjective reasons to hopefully make your life a little bit easier. So first question, what is a stable coin? And I consulted Investopedia to help me with that, and it says that a stable coin is a cryptocurrency which has a value that is packed or tied to that of another currency, commodity, or financial instrument. That sounds about pretty much right to me. But the more important question is, why is it useful? And the answer is because it enables you to hold stable value on-chain. That's similar like our dads used to hold Deutsche Mark under the bed, you know, hold stable value on chain. And the usual candidates are those guys here. So, interesting question is how big is the current stablecoin market? And we are sitting at $130 billion, which does look like a pretty big number, but it's actually just the market cap of Siemens, which is one. Rather big German company, but still just one company. Looking at the total crypto market, that one is about 10 times bigger, but still just the size of Google. Again, just one company. And then if we go to 10 times bigger again, we are reaching our favorite fiat coin, the euro, at 13 trillion. It fluctuates, depends a bit how the ECB counts their money, but we can say that we have about 100x from the current uh, supply of stable coins to reaching the euro. So plenty, plenty of room to grow. And here we have the 10 biggest stable coins sorted by market cap. But more important than market cap, at least in my opinion, is what the stable coin is backed by. Most of them are fiat-backed or centralized. Some of them, the green ones, are actually crypto-backed. But that, unfortunately, doesn't mean that they are really decentralized. But we'll come to that. In a Pyform chart, less than 5% of what we are operating with is truly, actually not truly decentralized, but in name decentralized, at least. So, the ideal stablecoin would have to solve the so-called stablecoin trilemma. Didn't happen yet. But the coin which would solve it would have to keep its pack very well. It should be scalable. And it should be decentralized. Because no such coin exists yet. Those that we have currently are optimizing for one side or two sides of the triangle. Pretty much all of the fiat-backed ones are on this side. So they optimize for scalability and peg. And then if we look at the decentralized boys, in the top 10 we have frogs. Uh, the problem with frogs is that it is backed by 95% by USDC, so uh, it's just wrapped USDC in my book, to be honest. We have DAI, uh, which we could say is the first kind of decentralized coin, but again, it is by 60% backed by USDC, and they have a DAO. This DAO does some weird decisions from time to time. So, but we can say, yeah, it's, it's semi-decentralized. The only really decentralized, to be honest, is liquid is LUSD, but it doesn't really scale well. So, no ideal coin yet. If you look at things from a bit different perspective, if we really try to optimize for decentralization, for resiliency, we can only take ETH and maybe stake ETH as collateral. So those are the prime collateral assets in our Ethereum ecosystem. And then, we end up just with one billion dollars. Or less than one percent. So less than one percent 
of the stable coins we have are truly decentralized. So, how do we then pick a stable coin? We can take the stable coin trilemma as a guideline and try to objectively qualify stable coins by peg. Scalability is not really useful for us as a user, so we will be looking at liquidity and decentralization, which I will be breaking down into governance risk and counterpart risk. And to make my life easier and the presentation a bit shorter, we'll be looking on the centralized side at USDC and USDC, and the centralized side at DAI and LUSD. I'll make a nice table. I'll be scoring them one to five, pretty straightforward, and in the end, we'll get the winner. So, first topic is the peg. And first, we'll be looking at the low each of those coins made in the last year. So the lowest it went. And we see Tether, does this work? It does. Tether and LUSD depegging about 5%, which is not good, but not that bad, while those two in the middle dropped 10%. That was in March, during what I call uh, DPEG weekend. And the second topic, maybe more important, is the three-month standard deviation from PEG. We see the two centralized ones doing very well. DAI, pretty good as well. LUSD, yeah, not so much. It kind of tends to go above the PEG quite often. But maybe more important, or at least equally important to how well it keeps the pack, is how quickly it can restore it when it loses it. And this is a nice chart I made during uh, DPEG weekend, so in March, where pretty much everything DPEG except USDC. We are looking at how quickly each stablecoin regained pegged, PEG. And the winner here is LUSD after 15 hours. USDC needed 36, and DAI needed 40. And to complete the round, we have BUSD from Binance at 18, Frox 35, and as I said, Tether. Tether did not depack. They had He had some volatility, but no depack. So putting it all together, I would score them like so. First topic done. Let's move on to liquidity. And here, I'll be looking at DEX liquidity because that's easily verifiable on-chain and that's what we are doing here. Total DEX liquidity. Tether, USDC and DAI are all in the billions range. LUSD just tiny 50 million. But that is not really a concern to us as the end user. Much more important, is the slippage that you get when you're trying to trade those coins. So I looked at the biggest trade you can do and still stay below 1% slippage. Here, DAI wins the round. The centralized Amigos are not far behind. LUSD, 10 million, pretty efficient. But you will have to decide if 10 million is enough for you or no? Whoops. So I would score them like so. Because those three have all sufficient liquidity on centralized exchanges. They can uh, satisfy you in any liquidity shape or form you would ever desire. I just gave them all five points. LUSD, I gave three points. And in our table, we covered so far the first two topics. Now the last one which should matter the most to us, because DeFi stands for decentralized finance, right? Not Discord finance. So let's have a look at decentralization. As I said, are we breaking it down by governance risk and counterparty risk? The first one being some kind of internal problem arising, and the second one some kind of external problem. But we'll go a bit deeper than that. We'll be looking at on-chain risk, which all coins are subject to, and off-chain risk, which 
the decentralized ones are not subject to that. They don't have no off-chain infrastructure. So off-chain, Tether, USDC. Uh, first topic are the reserves. So those coins need to be backed by something, and they are uh, mostly backed by cash and US treasuries, and those need to be custodied somewhere, which is done with BlackRock and similar big boy entities. Now, theoretically, those entities can do whatever they want with those funds in their custody. Is the risk big? I guess probably not. But the risk is bigger with the second topic, which is banking, which we saw two months ago uh, with a, with a uh, market-wide DPEG, when Silicon Valley Bank fought, started, and everything DPEGed as a result. So this, uh, this everything happened because Circle, the company issuing USDC, had some funds, $3 billion to be precise, in Silicon Valley Bank, and it just dropped based on this thought by 10%, so not that cool. Access to funds. If you actually want to mint those coins, you have to do it with, with those companies. And if those companies go bankrupt, then you have to file bankruptcy claims, claims. And I do not think you would be the first one in line to get your money back. Last one, Web2 shortcomings. Again, if you're minting them, you need to have an account, and this account can be restricted as any other Web2 account. So all of this boils down to our other trust assumptions. Do we like trust? We do not. So keep that in mind. On-chain risk, and we have all of our coins back again. And we'll be looking at governance risk, meaning we will ask ourselves, can there some unilateral change be implemented by those entities which would affect us negatively? Yes or no? Because the first two are companies, they have a legal, they have a company structure and this uh, leadership can do whatever they want. The answer is yes, changes can be implemented. DAI has a DAO who can do the same thing. LUSD does not have no governance, no DAO. The contracts are not upgradable, so not subject to any governance risk. Second topic is counterparty risk. We are asking ourselves, can the action of some third party affect us negatively? We saw with the centralized coins that there is a lot of on-chain risk there, so the answer is yes. DAI being unfortunately backed by 60% by USDC inherits all of those risks. LUSD does not have first party resistant, but there is, a, there is a technical risk, which is its dependence on the chain link ETH price. So is it likely the chain link would censor its feet? I don't know. I guess the chance exists, so I kind of left it to you to decide how much of a risk that is. And putting it all together, uh, yeah, we don't really have a winner. So what are you supposed to do? We covered the objective reasons, but maybe more important, as I said in the beginning, are the subjective reasons. And I like to ask myself, do I have absolute control over money? Pretty simple. Meaning no one can restrict me in any shape or form. And let me show you something interesting. The devs will know what that is. So that's a smart contract function. It's very, very funnily named, in my opinion, evil user. And if your self-custody wallet address ends up in here, the owner of the contract can block you from sending their tokens anyway. So you are stuck. It may even burn the entire token balance from within your self-custody wallet. Want to guess who that is? It's Tether. It's a rather funny company, but a bit risky. And USDC has the same. 
They're just not funny, they just have a blacklist. Um, DAI and LUC do not have such a function. So how many wallets are blacklisted? Thanks to Dune, we can see that USDT is at 880 and DAI at 160, uh, sorry, USDC at 160. So you might ask yourself, why would you get blacklisted in first place? Maybe because of some criminal activities or similar. But we truly can only speculate. One interesting guideline is what happened last summer when the US Treasury decided to sanction Tornado Cash. Tornado Cash is an application which lives on the blockchain and it enables you to mix coins to restore your privacy, so to say. But it can be also used by terrorists or so the US Treasury said. And then they said also that any US persons which interact with it would get quite a hefty fine. And what happened then is that Tornado Cash, uh, sorry, that USDC actually blacklisted all of the wallets associated with Tornado Cash and blocked their owners from accessing those funds. The funny thing is that this was done immediately after the announcement came out. So I would wager that they had some communication with the US Treasury beforehand. So, actually, I wanted to cover something else. This is one thing which could back blacklist you, but maybe uh, we see quite a lot of thought around B Binance and exchanges. We see quite a lot of uh, new things coming out regarding um, self-custody wallets, also related to Mika, that you can't send more than 1,000 euros without doing KYC, etc., etc. So. We might not have only evil protocols not to interact with, but maybe also something else which is evil would get you blacklisted and your funds frozen. Funds frozen. Sorry about that. So, how do you actually pick a stablecoin? Uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but it's pretty much a personal preference in my opinion. So you need to ask yourself, will I be optimizing for convenience and utility? Or will it be optimizing for decentralization and resilience? Or maybe you'll do something in between. Put some funds here, put some funds there, and just mix it up a little thing, which actually a lot of people do. So you need to kind of consider the regulatory outlook, the ecosystem you need, off-ramp, on-ramps, and all of the other things which might be relative and important to you, but maybe not to me. And of course, if the funds can be seized from within your wallet, which is pretty important to me. So it comes down to a personal preference. You are the owner of your funds. You have the personal responsibility to make an informed decision based on that. So just ask yourself, where do I want to put my funds where I feel comfortable with having them and just live with your choice. So, thank you very much. If you want to know more about Liquidity or get in touch with me, just go ahead and sign.